All right, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Hey, good to see you. Welcome to Connection Fellowship Church. We're so glad you're here this morning. And we are going to have some time worshiping the risen Savior and our risen Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And we're so glad you came this morning. We want to give a shout out to those who are viewing online. So you guys can't wave to them, but I will. And so we're missing you guys. I'm knocking music off the stand. (laughs) Sorry you weren't here for that. Um, We're missing you guys. We love you. We're glad you're viewing from home. And we hope that uh, today's service blesses you guys. We're glad you can be a part of it. Uh, even through uh, the internet. So again, a special thanks to Jacob Cooter. He's put a lot into uh, getting that live and the the tech team every week. So we're very thankful, thankful for you guys each week. And uh, we don't want you to forget those who are at home. uh, Since we're not all gathering each week, it's a challenge sometimes to stay in touch. So I just want to challenge you that if you could reach out each week, Call some people, let them know you miss them, maybe even talk to them over uh, Zoom or something like that, or social distance in the yard, whatever you feel comfortable with, and let them know you're glad, uh, you're glad to know them and you want to support them, encourage them. Uh, so we're having a special guest this morning to lead us in, in song, and so we're glad for that, Eric Gamble. <laughs> Kirk, yes, you can give a round of applause there, Eric. Uh, Kirk is still under the weather, so you can pray for him. He's on the, the way up, he's, uh, he's getting better, but uh, uh, Eric decided to, that he would be willing to fill in last minute, so y'all show him some love like you did the other week with Roger. Uh, we have a lot of very gifted people in the church, and so we're grateful for that, and uh, pray that they would be a blessing to you. As we get ready uh, f- to sing song to, the, to Jesus, we're going to start by praying. Um, so if you guys could stand with me, we're going to pray. We're going to be thinking about uh, Isaiah 6. And then after we get done praying, uh, Eric's going to lead us in two songs. So let's stand together. As we open up, we'll stand and we pray to the Lord. Lord, we're so thankful that your word reveals you as holy. And as I think about Isaiah 6 this morning, I, I thank you that even in the year when an earthly king, King Uzziah, had died... And there was a lot of chaos, and that king was a good king, and there was a lot of concern about what the future might hold and how they would even go on and their, their country would still be prosperous. In the midst of all of that, you revealed to Isaiah that regardless of what earthly king is or is not on the throne, you are always on the throne. And so we're thankful that how you reveal that to Isaiah, and I pray that you'd reveal the same to us, that we can trust you, Jesus, because you defeated death and you've risen again and you're seated in the throne of heaven as Lord and you reign supreme. And Lord, we thank you that your word reminds us in Isaiah 6 that you are high and lifted up and the train of your robe fills the temple with glory. Lord God, you are majestic, and all the angelic beings in heaven, they fly in Isaiah 6, and they cover their face in humility, and they cover their feet in humility, and they cry out that you're holy. Lord, I know that many times I forget that, and as a church we may forget that, but we want to say with the angelic beings, with Isaiah, that you are holy, 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 and you are the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of your glory. And we want to say together that, God, you are in a category all by yourself. You are beautiful. You are majestic. And there is none like you, Lord. We say with Isaiah, as we think about your holiness, that woe unto us, we are lost apart from you. Lord, we're people of unclean lips, Lord. And even more than that, we're people of unclean hearts. God, as we think about what we'll look at later on in the service, Lord, our hearts are many times filled with idolatry. Lord, I know mine is. And sexual immorality, God. And not only are we as the church, but out in our world, Lord, our cities and our country and the nations are full of that same idolatry and that same sexual immorality, Lord. And we confess that we are unclean before you, an awesome God, the King of glory, and, Lord, we just cry out to you, Lord, in this moment. We cry out and say we're unclean. We, we confess. We admit you know the depths of our heart. Lord, you know our struggles and our wrestles, Lord, even before we came, even now. 
And God, we just marvel at the fact that those that humble themselves before you like Isaiah did, Lord God, that you meet right where they are. And Lord, we thank you in Isaiah 6 that you provided atonement for Isaiah and that you brought that burning coal from off the altar and you brought it in the tongs to his lips and you touched him and you brought cleansing and you said his sin was atoned for. Lord, and we think about how many times in the scriptures, Lord, when people are brought before you like the woman caught in adultery and she was so broken, Lord, by her sin. And everybody around her was pointing fingers and bringing condemnation. And God, the only true king that could have judged her, you, Jesus, the perfect holy one mentioned in Isaiah 6, you looked at her in her broken and repentant state and you said, where are your condemners? And Lord, you told her that you don't condemn her And then you said, go and sin no more. We thank you for that amazing grace that even when we're in the depths of our sin, Lord, as we're having a broken and repentant heart by your spirit, that, God, you don't condemn us in the midst of that. You provided atonement for us through the cross. And by your resurrection, you give us power so we don't have to sin. Lord God, we praise you for that. And, Lord, that you send us out like Isaiah into a world, Lord, we, we go out humbly because we're desperately in need for grace, but we go out forgiven and changed into the world that you've put us in to love, the world that you long to redeem. You're so patient, not wishing that anyone should go into judgment, but, Lord, that all could be forgiven, Lord. We're so grateful for that. We pray now today, this time of song, this time of gathering around your word, this time of prayer, Lord, would put in us a desire to say, here am I, Lord, send me, forgiven, loved, transformed, changed by your your greatness out to the world that's in need. Lord, we pray for that. We pray that you would fall afresh on our time together. You would minister to every heart. Lord, we pray for your anointing on the word And as Eric leads through song, Lord, we just confess, me and Eric right here together right now, we confess that no matter how many times we have done this or we haven't done this, we confess that we are nothing apart from you, Lord. But God, you can do the impossible. And so we pray that you would use us, Lord, broken vessels, earthen vessels, and Lord, the surpassing greatness of the power and the glory would come from you in us and through us. So Lord, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless my brothers and sisters as we gather, Lord. Encourage us with your truth of your word and your gospel. And all those that watch from home, we love you. And we pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen. All right, y'all can stand seat, uh, stand seated. Y'all can stand seated. If you know how to do that, please do. <laughs> That's a Steve Ellis thing. He used to stand seated when he preached. Um, but we're going to leave the lights on, and Eric's going to lead us in two songs. And then we'll uh, turn our hearts to the word as we listen to it preached. Eric, thanks again for the last minute. We're here with you, buddy, and we're going to worship Jesus together.
Thank you for keeping me on track there. His heart is good, he's always kind, with the cross he grew, he's on our side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father. children of the King. In His love and mercy, He chose the lonely and the weak. In His heart is good, He's always kind. With the cross,
sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. No, the Lord's in never forsake his own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Well, now I am. Thanks. Uh, so glad that Eric uh, led us this morning. What a blessing. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Revelation in our series. Um, if you want to turn there, we're in a series called Lessons from the Seven Churches or uh, Lessons from the Seven Letters. And those are to the seven churches uh, in Asia, modern day Turkey. And we're calling that series Victorious Vision, and I hope you've enjoyed it. We've had several uh, sermons out of that series lately, and uh, we're just going to keep on plugging along. And as we begin, I just want to tell you about something that happened to me this weekend. Uh, This weekend, we visited some family at Lake Murray in Columbia, South Carolina. Anybody ever been to Lake Murray before? Yeah, you like that? Woo-hoo, okay. So for several years now, there has been an an ornithological, help me out there, phenomenon. Okay, Uh, during the summer months, June and July, what happens there is there's over 400,000 purple martins. Okay, that's a type of species of bird. Before I got there, somebody told me there was 400,000 blue marlins, and I was getting ready for fish, but they were mistaken. Okay, so it was 400,000 purple martins, and this is a specific uh, species of bird. And they come to Lake Murray to roost and escape for cooler weather, migrate south for the winter. And what happens is during the day, all 400,000 fly out to find food um, in the morning before sunrise. And then at sunset, all 400,000 birds, uh, roughly, okay, (laughs) roughly fly back to roost on a small island known as, yes, or Bomb Island. So same, same island. And we were actually out there uh, on a pontoon watching them come back that night right before sunset this weekend. It was a pretty amazing thing. If you can imagine that many birds flying overhead in one direction, just think about it. So we would look up and we'd see like three flying uh, by themselves. And we look up on the other side and there'll be like a hundred in one group flying, all drawn by the same innate desires to stay with the group and get back to the island all flying one way and one destination. And as I watched all those birds, Anna thought I was thinking about birds, but I was thinking about the Christian life, okay? I was thinking about the Christian life, and I thought the only thing that would keep one of those birds from following the rest of those birds is if in midair that bird turned into a water buffalo, okay? You know what I'm talking about? And that that bird turned to a water buffalo, fell into the water, and then that water buffalo be swimming in the water. He'd be like, peace, I'm out of here. I'm going back to the mainland. That'd be the only thing that would stop that bird from going and following his innate birdly desires. And as I thought about that, I thought in life, there is a huge temptation to do what everybody else is doing, especially in the culture. Anybody agree with me? There's a pull to get the approval of men. There's a pull to fit in, and the culture is desiring that. And yet, this is interesting, in the gospel, the gospel is not that Jesus wants to leave us just the way we are. And actually, that's a gospel that many in our day are promoting and pushing, even in very prominent churches uh, in the U.S. But that's not the gospel at all. The gospel is that Jesus loves us in spite the way we are, He came for us because of that love. He died. He raised again. Why? To rescue us from the way we are and transform us into the way he is so that we might live for his glory. And that's really what the Christian life is about. In the new birth, we get turned to water buffaloes. No, just kidding. We get turned to those who desire the things of God. 
right? Not perfectly, but we begin that journey as the children of God, and he has promised to be with us and not let us go, right? And to do that for his glory. So in the letter to Thyatira, okay, and I don't know what you want to call this morning. I'm going to call it Thyatira. I might change it mid-sermon, who knows? And we might say Thyatira, I don't know. But we're going to call it Thyatira, and we're going to read that text together. So if you have a copy of God's word, let's open it to Revelation 2 and look at verse 18. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. He said, I know your works, your love, and, and service, and patience, and endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Verse 20, But I have this against you, and again, this is Jesus speaking, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice what? You guys say that with me? Sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And if you read last week when we looked at the church at Pergamum, Jesus accused of Thyatira for the same thing that he accused Pergamum for, practicing sexual morality and eating food sacrificed to idols. Verse 21. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent. If you notice, repent is mentioned three times in this section. Behold, I will, oh, sorry, and I will strike her children dead. Again, this is a reference to her spiritual children there. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. Verse 24. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who, do not, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what, I, what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron and with earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray one more time. Lord God, we're so thankful for this word now, and we do pray that you would bless it, Lord, that you would move in power for your glory, that you would help me in my weak state, God, that you would give your people your word, you'd feed them, that you'd feed us. And God, I pray there's anybody here who's never come to faith in Christ, I pray this day, even virtually, that you would save them and that you'd bring them out of darkness and into your marvelous light, Lord. We're so blessed that we have your word and we pray now Jesus, by your authority and power that you would minister to your church, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so verse 18, it says, And to the angel of the church at Thyatira. So in the first century, Thyatira was well known for its metal and fabric guilds, which would have made it very easy for them to find their identity and their economic accomplishments. It became one of the greatest centers of marketing and manufacturing in Asia. Again, modern-day Turkey. Wool, linen, leather workers, tanners, dyers, potters, bronze smiths, you name it, it was found in Thyatira. There was a very large number of trade guilds, and each metal and fabric guild usually had a patron deity. And if you don't know what a patron deity is, it was a god who basically acts as protector over that guild, protector over that city, and in this case, their com- com- commerce and prosperity, right? And so for Thyatira, the patron god was the sun god, Tyrmenos, and his counterpart, the Greek sun god, Apollos. This means to be received in the social scene or to take part in the periodic patron deity feast, it meant compromise on many levels. And you can imagine that draw. So there were pressure for citizens to jump on board the idolatry bandwagon. Do you ever feel that in the culture that you live in? 
And that pressure was there because to reject the patron deity was seen to be anti your city and anti your town and anti the prosperity of your own people. In similar fashion, I think there are things about our culture and its idolatrous tendencies that we should reject. But when we do reject them, this will earn us the title of un-American or anti well, the well-being of the people, or even maybe even unchristian, in our culture that we're in today. But in that moment of peer pressure, wherever it's coming from, or that pressure to have potential compromise, we need to be reminded that our greater loyalty is always to who? King Jesus, right? We've been singing about that. The risen Lord Jesus speaks to a city of metal workers with images that they will understand when he says, I have fiery eyes and melt, molten hot feet. We've already seen this lengthy description of Jesus and the title in uh, Revelation 1.16 when we started, and it included this description. And here, the only time in the book of Revelation Jesus refers to him as the Son of God. Why do you think he picked that out for this particular church in this particular city? Well, most commentators think it's because in the context there, the emperor of that day choose to refer to himself as Apollos incarnate. That's pretty humble, right? The God incarnate, the God come to earth, the son of Zeus, right? But Jesus is saying to that church in that city where that's going on, there is only one God and you ain't him, <laughs> right? He's Southern today, right? Okay. <laughs> There's only one God, it's not Apollo, it's not the emperor, and that one true God has revealed himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord of all. So what does Jesus want to reveal about himself through these particular images up front? Well, Jesus' eyes were like a flame of fire. We talked about this before. Jesus' eyes in that image are like lasers. They're piercing, they're penetrating, they're all searching. You know, sometimes my kids referring to something else will be like, hey, they saw into my soul, okay? Referring to some cartoons, that's what happens. Jesus can see through you into your very being. He sees through facades and fakes and false teaching which is really important, especially in this church at Thyatira, right? He sees inwardly and he always has the right evaluation of our lives. And that's what the flaming eyes are a reference to, symbolic of. His feet are like burnished bronze. There's several things going on here. One of my friends in small group, Mark, said this, isn't it cool that when Jesus' eyes are like flames of fire, it's like he turns the light on, the roaches scatter, right? Because he's got so much truth and light and purity. But not only that, those bronze legs, he's not moving. He's not going to slide or compromise in any way, left or right. He's got those strong bronze uh, feet. And in ancient times, those feet, those bronze feet were a sign of judgment. And Jesus' feet are glowing hot with purity and power, making Jesus alone the only one who is able to rightly judge people and ultimately at the end crush his enemies, okay? That's a good reminder for us. We aren't Jesus in that regard. His judgment is always perfect. Let's give it over to Jesus, right? So what is the encouragement or the compliment or the commendation he gives Thyra Tyra? He says in verse 19, if you're following along, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. So if you think back to the churches we've already covered, Thyatira just didn't start well and slip off into lovelessness towards the end like the church at Ephesus. Thyatira's faith and love fireworks display of serving others was actually even greater than the first bright flickers that were seen when God lit them into action the day he saved them, right? And he's saying with time, there was maturity and there's growth and there's progress and some critical areas, right? Like loving other people and serving other people. And he says to them, this is a good thing. This is my work in you. He doesn't come across completely and say, there's nothing good in this church. He's saying, I am doing stuff here. I'm doing stuff. And here I have a question for us. Are we similar to Thyatira? Are we concerned with having a love for others and faith in Jesus that will lead us to con a continual overflow of good works and service to those in our context. This is especially critical in days like we're living in with COVID and other things that are going on on the social scene. 
Are there people in our body right now that God is encouraging you to reach out to in service, and how will you do that? I'm praying that God would give us strength and faith and strength and love to minister to people in this critical time of our life. So maybe that would be the first thing. Are there some people that I need to minister to? I think a lot about the the tech team and Jacob and people like that. They're using their skill set and they're serving this time when it's critical to meet the needs of others who can't watch from home. And we're super thankful for that. Next, Jesus offers not just the uh, uh, encouragement or compliment to Thyatira. He offers a rebuke or a correction. He says in verse 20, but I have this against you that you tolerate that woman, Je- Jezebel. And every time you say that woman or that man, it's, <laughs> it's not going to go well, right? It's uh, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice, here's the key right here, sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, the last time I preached, Uh, Pergamum had similar problems, similar corrections. I focused a lot at that time on the idolatry that was present, and I didn't focus as much on the sexual immorality that was present. This time that I'm preaching, I'm going to focus more on the sexual immorality that was present rather than the idolatry present, but there's a lot of overlap. So Thyatira was strong in love, evidenced in their works and their service, but they lacked the discernment needed to reject heresy and worldly compromise, okay? They lack that. So you may be asking, was there an actual woman named Jezebel in the church at Thyatira, right? Or was it someone in the church who had Jezebel-like qualities? And I think the answer is the latter. You can read about Jezebel in 1 Kings and 2 Kings if you want to. Jezebel, if you're not familiar with the Old Testament, was... uh, From Tyre and and Sidonia, she married which king in Israel's history? Anybody know? King Ahab, that's right. And violently imposed worship of the Canaanite false god Baal or Baal in the northern kingdom of Israel. And she led Israel into idolatry. How would you like to be known for that? And she did this through her influence on her husband or over her husband. You're like, Are you sure? Yes, it's in the Bible. 1 Kings 21, 25. Summarizes Ahab's life, again, Jezebel's husband, by saying, there was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab. Then it adds, whom his wife incited. That is, Jezebel was responsible for moving or motivating Ahab to action, stirring up or spurring him up to evil and idolatry. Again, Ahab had his role in that, but Jezebel was moving him forward in that regards. And this is what you see if you give an overview of Jezebel's life in 1 Kings. Jezebel is associated with idolatry, with whorings, with sorcery, with deceit, with slander. She had a man, Naboth, who had a vineyard that her husband wanted, and she worked single-handedly to make sure Ahab got that vineyard, and it, was, it happened through deceit and murder and theft. And in her final hours of her life, Jezebel was found doing her makeup and her hair. I think that's a very interesting note that is made in 2 Kings. She's found doing her makeup and her hair before she uh, faces the judgment of God and gets thrown out a tower, and then she's eaten by dogs, the scripture says. And in the church at Thyatira, there was a woman who was known for similar sinful qualities. One commentator says she was most likely a prominent woman in the church who, like her Old Testament counterpart, was influencing people of God to forsake loyalty to God by promoting a tolerance toward and involvement in pagan practices. Revelation 2.20 says she calls herself a prophetess. And what is a prophetess? A woman who claims to speak on God's behalf. But the problem was she was speaking contrary to God's word and the way she taught and the way she lived was causing real believers and servants of God to be led astray into sin and compromise. The food sacrificed to idols in this text was most likely a reference to the meat that was eaten at pagan feasts. And the sexual immorality, I remind you the other week, was a literal reference to the sexual sin that took place in, in those pagan festivities in those cities. Historians note again and again in Asia Minor that those pagan feasts in Asia were filled with drunkenness, immorality, incest, homosexuality, and 
bestiality. And what's happening is Jezebel was actively working to teach and seduce the servants of God to compromise with idolatrous aspects of pagan society. And I believe many in our day are doing the same. What do you think? Inside and outside the church. Many of the places where we work, the people we work with and hang with, the businesses where we buy our stuff from, the commercials that we view on social media, the ads that pop up, our spouses, the schools and churches we attend, the politicians we support, the media we follow, the people who create the books and movies and shows we consume, listen, are diligently working. Do you guys think so? They are diligently working. And what are they doing? Many are working so that the church will take what God clearly calls sin, and the church will take that, and they'll relabel it, and they'll move it over from the uh, sinful category and move it over here to the non-sinful category. And I think we see that pull. They don't want just our indifference to sin. They want our approval of sin, and they want our involvement in sin. Anybody ever feel like that before? It's not just enough that we don't do it. They want us to approve it, and they want us involved. Romans 132 actually says that very thing. So my friend was just telling me, and I'm just going to illustrate this out a little bit. Maybe I'm going to go uh, too long on this, but I hope hopefully you'll see uh, how it impacts your life because it sure has impacted mine. My friend was just telling me he's using a popular app on his phone to help his kids learn Spanish, right? And on a particular lesson he was working with, on his, with his kids the other day, there was a picture of the woman and then the Spanish sentence underneath that you were supposed to translate was, I am a man, okay? So a picture of a woman, the app for learning Spanish underneath was a translation of the sentence that said, I am a man. In high school, my best friend at the time invited me over. We were very young. And he, when I came over, the first thing he wanted to do was expose me to a mountain of pornographic magazines that his older brother had given him, my best friend at the time, which began a, an addiction that lasted for years and years and years, even on to, into my Christian life. I mean, the Lord only freed me from it by his grace around 10 years ago. Going to the beach after I first became a believer again, I became a believer in 1999. I was about 17 years old. I was hanging out with a group of friends, some professing Christians, some not. We're all mixed up together, hanging out at Myrtle Beach. During that trip, the group as a whole placed severe pressure on me to underage drink, to hook up with girls, and to do other things like that. What a, what a pressure. Throughout the years, friends and coworkers have invited me to restaurants like Hooters and similar establishments that you know, you know people don't go to just because they have good wings. That's not why people go usually, right? Before marriage, there was a constant pressure and struggle on me from friends and the culture to be physically intimate with women who weren't my wife because that was just the norm of what you did. In seminary, I had a weekly gathering with some friends where we watched one of the top series and top shows on TV. Uh, I had them in my house each week in my apartment, and one of my pastors at that time heard about it because we were freely talking about it at church in the hallway. And later he contacted me privately, and humbly he asked me to consider the content of the show that I was taking in and promoting to others, especially because of the immodest nature of some of the things in there. You think you're going to remember that <laughs> if your pastor calls you and says, hey, I got to talk to you. But you know what? That was one of the most impactful things in my Christian life because of his humility, because of his grace, because of his, his concern, because of his love. I can't drive down Interstate 80, 85 without having to look away from that same billboard with sexually graphic content on it every time I go down. Recently, I watched a kid's show with my girls it was just super basic, super simple. It was very clean, and towards the middle of it, the girls in the movies were wearing skirts, and in one of the scenes, they ripped the sides of their skirts up and said, now we are cool in a kid's show. So, I mean, I'm just saying, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. This pressure for us to conform, especially in regards to sexual sin. And one of the commentators I read 
uh, regarding Thyatira said, in a city whose economic life was dominated by trade guilds in which pagan religious practices had become the criteria for membership, Christian converts would be faced with the problem of compromising their stand at least enough to allow participation in a common uh, meal dedicated to some pagan deity. To reject that accommodation would mean social isolation and economic hardship. And for us, it may be a loss of the same, okay? Or maybe it's just a loss of physical pleasure or the thrill of getting to select the entertainment of our choice on our TVs. But either way, there's a, there's a loss of some kind. And what Jesus says here against Thyatira, the critique is that they tolerate something, right? Tolerate. And in our day and age, the world we live in, the culture is telling us we need to tolerate what? Everything, right? <laughs> I mean, it's everything, right? And as Christians, we know that's false, right? We know that's false. I mean, you never want to tolerate something that Jesus says to not tolerate, which is what's happening in this text again. And as parents, we know this makes absolute sense, right? I mean, consider the fact if your toddler was playing in a very busy intersection and you figured that out, and all of a sudden you would be like casually strolling to the curb. Is that, is that how you would do this? casually they're in their intersection the cars are flying everywhere you just casually walk over to the curb and when you get to the end of the curb you yell who am I to judge have have fun no we wouldn't do that we know what it means to be a good parent and it's interesting in our culture with this word tolerate in the text that we've got things all backwards. We tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate we don't tolerate things I mean it's all backwards for example in some mom groups, you will receive more disapproval over the fact that you fed your kids Cinnamon Toast Crunch than if you were announcing that you were about to leave your husband for an affair, right? That happens in our culture, and nobody thinks it's backwards, but Jesus thinks it's backwards. And Jezebel apparently said something like, eating at a, a meal in an idol feast is no big deal, even if that meal and celebration leads you into some kind of sexual compromise, it's no big deal. Again, this is false, right? And that failure to correct Jezebel ends up leading some in the church to follow her example. And the result is that the redeemed community is no different than the lost community that they were redeemed from and they were redeemed to serve. That's what happens. Jesus says of the sexual compromise, sorry, Jezebel, Jezebel says of the sexual compromise, it's no big deal. Join us. But if you look at the text in Revelation 2, Jesus says of that compromise, what does he say? Anybody know? He says, repent, right? He says, repent. Now, repentance, we've talked about it several times because it's mentioned over and over again in our series, but I want to remind us, repentance is literally in the New Testament a word that's translated change of mind, right? And in the Old Testament, it communicates the idea of a U-turn, right? So a returning to God, right? And as one theologian says, repentance is an inward turning away from sin to God with the full purpose of new obedience. Think about this, church. Repentance isn't just a one-time thing you do at salvation. You're like, I'm good. Check that box. I repented right? No, but for every true Christian and dwelt by the Spirit, repentance becomes a lifestyle, right? A lifestyle. Maybe when you were first saved, you were repenting of sleeping with someone that wasn't your spouse, and maybe as you've grown spiritually, you realize that all forms of sexual immorality need to be repented of, right? Ephesians says there shouldn't be even a hint of sexual immorality in the believer's life. But here's the thing. The beauty in repentance is this, that a holy God would give second chances. That's beautiful. If you notice in this text, he says things, we might not get it to all of it, but he says things like, I'm giving Jezebel an opportunity to repent. Even after he, after he starts talking about all the things that he's going to bring in their lives, judgment and hardship, he says, I'm going to do that unless they repent. 
The beauty is that a holy God would give second chances, that he would offer to anyone, including us, an opportunity to receive the forgiveness of sins, to be renewed through the power of Holy Spirit, and enable us to live free, to love others the way he's chosen for us to love, that God would say, you don't have to dishonor me anymore. You don't have to be burdened down by your guilt. You don't have to live outside of my design for your life and for sexuality. You can start over again, right? You can be renewed and have a renewed sense of my presence and my purpose in your life. This is the beauty about God. This is a phenomenal thing. I love this scene in The Chosen. I don't know if you've seen that series online, it's amazing, with the Samaritan woman who is immoral. And it says in John 5 that she's had five husbands. And in that scene, Jesus is offering her salvation and true fulfillment and eternal life in himself. And he says things like, hey, if you come to me, you'll never be thirsty again. This is what I have laid out for you, a sinner, just like all of us. And she's, he says, I came for you. And she says, I think you picked the wrong person. I don't know if you've ever felt like that before. She says, I'm rejected by others. And he says, but not the Messiah. She says, I'm going to tell everyone. And he says, I was counting on it. It's beautiful as we think about this God who actually longs to love sinners and work so much in their life to change and work and turn them into the people that he longs for them to be. Again, he says to a Jezebel, I gave you time to repent. And here's my question today. Have we adopted a cultural standard of living that is actually contrary to God's word? I'm going to say it a different way. Is there any sexual immorality in our life today that we need to repent of? Any? I'm just going to throw that out there and let it sit for a second. Is there any sexual morality or compromise like that, that God is calling us by his spirit to repent of. He says at the very end of this letter, whoever has ears to hear, right? Given by the spirit, would you hear this and would you respond according to his will? Another question, are we leading another person into some kind of sexual immorality? And if we are, will we repent? And in this subject, because it's so heavy, I do, subject matter, I do want to say a couple of things. For those who have been molested or abused or raped, where an oppressor has harmed you, I want you to know that that's not your fault. It isn't your fault. You don't need forgiveness. Your oppressor does. And I want to beg you to tell someone so we can help you. Also, for those who have been guilty of sexual sin in the past, and they've repented of it, I don't want to let the devil twist my words and use them to bring condemnation into your life. I want you to know that Jesus loves you. He's died for you. He's raised again. He says now in Christ, if you have believed and trusted in him, there is now no longer any condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You're free. Live to free others. So he goes on and he says, but to the unrepentant Jezebel... Jesus says, judgment is coming unless you repent. You say, hey, that's pretty heavy. Well, the answer to that is, yeah, it is pretty heavy. There's judgment for Jezebel. Jesus will throw her into a sickbed. There's judgment for those who commit adultery with her, which is most likely a reference to those getting really close to the edge and flirting with that type of compromise. It says, they'll be thrown into a great tribulation. And for her children or spiritual children, those who've moved from flirtation with those ideas to to being totally converted to her compromising way of living and practicing, it says Jesus will strike them dead. That's heavy, right? That's very heavy. And I don't know what form of temporal judgment that might take in this life, right? But Jesus said, it's going to happen. He did it similarly in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Paul said in the church at Corinthians, people were taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And because they were doing it, and they were doing it really laissez-faire casually, and because they weren't repentant of it, Paul said that's why some are weak, some are ill, and some have even died. But again... Where there is severe judgment mentioned, there is always a prospect for severe mercy, okay? For all who repent, severe mercy. Verse 23 says, 
and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Again, the risen Lord Jesus searches. That means that nothing can be hidden from him. The risen Lord Jesus will give just judgment. Each will receive judgment proportionate to the unrepentant deeds they've done against the living God, both now and eternally. And here's the thing. When you see the unrepentant humbled by God, whatever form that takes, their lives crumbling as they cling to their sin and disobedience, whether that's inside the church or outside the church, it becomes a reminder of this, that God is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do. You know the difference between learning something out of a textbook and then learning something experientially? Have anybody seen that distinction right there? Me too. But here he says, as he moves to bring judgment on the unrepentant, it's going to tell the whole church of Christ, God is who he says he is, and he does what he says he will do, right? That happened to me. Again, this idea from knowledge to, uh, sorry, knowledge, like a textbook, to actual experientially. I alluded to it earlier, but one year after I was a believer, one year I was compromising at the beach with my friends at parties, in many different ways, the whole time I had now had the indwelling power of the Spirit of God within me. So the first time in my life as a young adult, I was like, man, God, I know that you don't want me to be doing this. Has anybody ever felt that before? Inside the Holy Spirit moving and saying, you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be doing this. I've got something better for you. Well, that's what was going on the first year after I became a believer. I was like 18, 17, 18 years old. As that was happening, one night, I came down with the worst case of food poisoning I've ever had in my life. Okay, stay away from Burger King. That's all I'm saying. I'm just checking. (laughs) I literally thought I was going to die. All my friends, they were in the other room. Some of them passed out. I was in the bathroom by myself. I was completely white. I mean, I was pasty, white, deathly sick. And I looked into the mirror and I thought, I'm going to die. That's what I thought. And I was really scared, and I was alone. And in that moment, the Lord spoke to my heart. And this is about what he said within my heart. He said, you're mine. Repent. I'm like, yes, sir. (laughs) But, you know, that was the most loving thing that God could say to me in that moment. And you know what? Actually, in that moment, to this day, that happened like forever ago. I'm 37 years old. But what the text says happened in my life that day, I was like, God searches hearts. He's a holy God. He, he does things because he's just and he's loving. And in his mercy, he actually moves many times in our lives when we're caught up in sin as his children because he loves us. And he says, hey, you're mine. That's not for you. I love you. I've got a better way. And you know what? That interaction of God in my life, I go back to many times. It was an anchor point where I look back and I say, God, you are great. You love me. You're holy. You've got better plans for me. I need to take you seriously. I think that's lacking in the church that we don't take him seriously. You've got something better. You want to glorify yourself in my life. And so you act in these moments. And God did. And he was merciful, severe. He gave me a severe mercy that day, a severe mercy. And this is what I want to conclude with. I don't have time to tease out everything else I would like to tease out in this text, but this is what I want to show us towards the end. God says this in verse 26 through the end. He says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I want you to be very clear. I want to be very clear here. Jesus is not teaching salvation by works here. He's not. The one who conquers or overcomes is the one who has been born of God through faith. Okay? I'm not making this up. 1 John 5, 4. Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, 1 John 5, 4 says. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. But here's the truth. You ready? Through though, sorry, though an individual is saved by faith alone, 
Saving faith is never alone. Did y'all get that? Though an individual is saved by faith alone, saving faith is never alone because it can't be. It resulted in the birth of a new spiritual person with new affections and new desires for God and for the things of God and for the desires of God and for the design of God. He turned that purple Martin into a water buffalo and everybody loves water buffalo. Okay, And that's what he does. And in an upside down, ironic overcoming in this life, because overcoming spiritually equals suffering and pressure and rejection from this world, in the midst of all of that, God by his spirit's working in you and in you and in you, those who've professed faith in Christ, and he's working in you, not that you're perfect, but that you you can begin to see plainly, see plainly the work of the new birth and the evidence of God's grace in your life. He does this. Even so many times you're like down on yourself and you're like, oh, I feel so bad and I'm awful and all this stuff. And people around you say, I see the work of God in your life. I see God transforming you from where you were to over here and he's growing you. And that's what God is doing to the degree that those people imperfectly are seeing the conquering of faith in their lives. And Jesus says, those people, they're mine. And I promise they will rule the nation one day and receive a star. And don't worry, guys, it's not the star that you get put on you, the little sticker. I want to talk about it for a second. What does it mean when he says rule the nations? This is a direct reference to Psalm 2, 8 through 9. And the point is that the followers of Messiah will share in his final rule. Very fascinating. And this, this, I thought this was very fascinating, but in the culture that they were in, the believer at that time was oppressed and pushed down, right? But in the new heavens, in the new earth, the believer actually be, it will be flipped and the believer will be reigning with Christ. This rule will begin the day we die and we come to heaven. In this life, people will oppress us by unrighteous rulers and influences, and yet by faith, we will resist. And in the life to come, because of Jesus' victory, God's people will shepherd the nations one day in the purity of righteousness, and the authority that we're given that day will be a gift from the Son of God, and that authority will never be taken away from us. So what is symbolized by the morning star? That's a great question. So in the ancient world, especially in Rome, the planet Venus became a symbol of sovereignty, okay? And you know what Venus's nickname was? Anybody know? Take a, an educated guess. What was Venus's nickname, the planet? The Morning Star. That was Venus's nickname. Venus was called the Morning Star because in the eastern sky, that's the sky in Asia, in Israel, Venus is usually seen in the early morning hours, right? And it doesn't it doesn't appear to just twinkle a little bit, but instead it glows and it glows steadily and it's a silver light, which makes it the brightest of stars in the sky. And one commentator said this, Roman emperors claimed to be descended from the goddess Venus. Roman generals built temples dedicated to the star Venus and the Venus star was even engraved on the shields of the Roman soldiers. Also, a messianic prophecy in Numbers 24, 17 said, a star in a scepter will rise up. Does anybody know what that's a reference to? It's a reference to Jesus. It's a prophecy of Jesus. It refers to Jesus, the Messiah, who will have absolute authority and he will judge uh, and rule over his enemies. Similarly, in Rome, Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Jesus is announced that he is from a kingly line and it calls him there, he calls himself what? the bright and morning star. So when Jesus says, I am the morning star in Revelation 22, I believe it's his way of saying, I'm the only true king. I'm the only true sovereign. In the sky of your existence, I should be the brightest influence in your life. So Jesus will give to the one that conquers by faith, the morning star. And I think what this means is, he will give us the gift of himself fully and finally in the new heavens and the new earth. And with himself, he will give us the right to rule over his renewed universe forever. And this is the promise 
for those that conquer. A promise that is sealed because Christ has died and raised for you because of his great love for you, to redeem you and to make you his and to live through you. Let's pray together and we're gonna turn our hearts towards song. As Eric comes up to lead us on our final song, we'll stand together. But as we do, let's repent as a church. Let's turn to God who loves us and who has promised that those that repent, he will forgive and he will work in their lives. And let's put our hope ultimately in the promises of the Lord as we look to him during this time. Let's pray together. Lord God, we are so grateful for your word. We're thankful for the hope there is for sinners like me, that Lord, you love us and that you pursue us and that you're calling many of us even today. I I pray that we would hear you. You give us ears to hear what your spirit has to say to us. And, Lord, we would find hope in you again like that woman caught in adultery that she turned to you humbly and repentantly and you said, I'm not going to condemn you. I came for you. Now go and sin no more. I pray, Father, that would be the word to us this morning. We wouldn't harden our hearts like the Jezebels and the spiritual children of Jezebel, but we would say, you're right, God, you're good, you're loving, you have eyes like fire and feet like burnished bronze. And we would choose rather to conquer by faith and repent and turn to you today, Lord. We love you. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for our time in worship today. Lord, you be glorified in our time as we close and send us out for your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's stand together and sing.
Amen. Well, give uh, Eric a round of applause if you don't mind. Eric, thank you so much. We're super blessed. Thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. Again, I want to encourage you to reach out to so many that are not able to make it with us um, on Sundays. Let them know you love them. Let them know you're thinking about them. Maybe you can visit it in some way that is comfortable for them. And uh, I want you guys to know you're loved and you are sent Connection Fellowship. God bless you. Y'all make your way.